Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. You, my friend, are in for an awesome, energizing, practical, powerful treat today. You'll recognize this week's guest as a world-renowned fitness expert. She's a distinguished nutritionist. She's also a world-renowned wellness entrepreneur. As one of the original trainers of the hit reality television series, The Biggest Loser, Jillian Michaels has built an empire in the health and in the wellness arena. She's an eight-time New York Times bestselling author. She's published numerous successful fitness DVDs, has sold more than 100 million of them from the outside. Many would probably imagine that Jillian Michaels has all the success and that it all came naturally. She was just born physically fit. She was just born energetic. She was just born, in other words, successful. And yet today, Jillian will open up about her struggles as a child with obesity, lack of confidence, facing ridicule from her peers, and then the cool thing, the turning point, the inflection point that provided newfound confidence and triggered an appreciation for fitness to provide empowerment in all facets of life. It's a great story. It's so empowering. So I want you today to grab something to take notes because you will leave this conversation with a plethora of practical tips, a step-by-step instruction on how to grow and improve in every aspect of living well and living inspired. My friends, without farther ado, join me in welcoming our newest friend. Her name is Jillian Michaels. Jillian, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hi, how are you? (laughs) I'm awesome and even more awesome having you on the show. So thank you for saying yes. Thanks for spending some of your day with us. And for the three people who were somehow born under a rock, have never (laughs) seen television, never been inside of a Walgreens or a Sam's or in a bookstore, and somehow have never come across your name or the work you do, tell us briefly about what you're up to today. Um, Well, I, I am a personal trainer and a certified nutritionist. I have been fortunate enough to be doing what I do um, since I was about 17 years old, which I don't need to date myself, but it was kind of a while ago. And uh, I'm also very lucky to be in a position um, where I have access to incredible, incredible professionals in both the fields of nutrition um, and, and physical medicine, whether it's... Uh, literally having physical therapists um, work with me to help me understand the best ways of rehabilitating a a client or a registered dietitian to help create every meal plan in my app. Um, So I, I have four different certifications. I owned a sports medicine facility. I do continuing education for other fitness professionals. Um, I'm just constantly looking to learn more and grow and explore my field. And uh, I'm lucky to love what I do. And I would imagine, Jillian, some people walk past with their shopping cart and see a picture of you with your arms in the air and your yoga pants on and they think, gosh, how lucky was she to be born with that physique, that body, that intelligence? Huh. Uh, she had oh, piece- intelligence. I love it. That doesn't get well, thrown in there often. <laughs> I will take that one. You have it in space without a doubt. We'll talk more about that moment. You're very kind. Your, your story is not one of these. It's not one of, hey, the red carpet was rolled out for you. You had a difficult upbringing. Your mother is a remarkable character. Would you talk a little bit about your mom? Well, my mom actually um, is, is a, that is where I am. I am exceptionally fortunate. Uh, my mom is a she has a PsyD. Essentially, she's a doctor in, in psychotherapy. She has her doctorate in psychotherapy. Very, very intelligent, uh, strong woman. And um, my mom has kind of a rags, I won't say riches, but, but she came from nothing, you know, failed out of high school and ended up graduating magna cum laude with a, with a doctorate. Like she's, she's an incredible, incredible woman. Um, what, and I'm- ask you about that. I, I haven't yeah. heard that story. How do you go from failing out to graduating with magna cum laude? 
Well, this is kind of an interesting story and I, I, I wish my mom was kind of here to tell it, but she, she had a tough upbringing and she always thought she was stupid for a host of reasons. And this was late sixties, I guess. And she was desperate to, to kind of get out of her house and get out of that environment. And she ended up meeting my dad, who's not the greatest guy. So I wasn't quite as fortunate right. <laughs> in that area. Um, and he would call her the dummy. Uh, all, you know, she was, again, like they met when she was literally, I don't even think she was 20. Um, she, she thought she was dumb. She's like, I guess I'm dumb. Um, marries my father, puts him through law school, working as a secretary, and then decides, and I wish I, I wish she was here because I actually don't really know the exact impetus for each and every sort of mm -hmm. move in her life, but she then went back to school, ended up going, got the GED, went to Northridge, um, graduated magna cum laude, got into public relations, hated it, absolutely hated it was in her own therapy, um, got me into therapy as a kid and realized she was extremely passionate about how transformative uh, a good therapist can be in someone's life, how, how much of a difference and an impact they could have. She goes back to school, gets her master's in psychotherapy, becomes a marriage family child counselor, mm. then goes, loves it so much, goes back to school and gets her doctorate and she is, uh, is now a psychoanalyst at one of the top institutes in the country. Um, and she's kind of a, yeah, my mom's a, she's a baller. She, <laughs> I, I, she's, a, she's a really cool woman. I, I, I have a lot of respect for her. That is a great term to use for any human being, but in particular, a, <laughs> a, a late 60s, early 70 year old. Yeah, she's 71. She's a baller. Yeah, she's just, a, yeah, she's, she is, uh, she's an impressive lady. Um, well, she, so, I, you know, I had a lot of advantage there having her as a mom. She raised a baller too, but it, it took you a while to fully recognize the skills around that. You grew up, and, and this was news to me, Jillian, until I learned a little bit more about your story. You grew up lacking body image. We see the DVDs, 100 million sold. We see mm -hmm. you on television. We see you on the, on the talk shows, all the confidence in the world. And yet as a little girl, you were lacking it mightily. You know, as a kid, we all have a crutch. Um, we do. I'm sorry. We all, we all do. Nobody is perfect. We're all going to engage in behaviors that can be destructive. Not to extraordinary degrees, but we can drink too much. We can spend money we don't have. We can eat food. You know, that's, we can overconsume food. We will often engage in things that provide us with comfort, right, or control. Um, in my case, as a kid, food did give me, it gave me comfort, it gave me control. Um, and it also was one of the ways I bonded with my dad because my dad was overweight. We didn't really relate well. Uh, we would have these kind of, he was kind of a, a wild character and in, in, in fun ways, like there were always these kind of crazy adventures. Um, and that I and that I relate to, and and that's some of the good that I that I take away for sure and incorporate um, with my own kids. Mm -hmm. But he food, you know, it was like, oh, we're gonna go to our chicken shawarma place. We're gonna go to our you know meatball sub place. Like I could tell you every food place, right? It was like, oh, we're gonna get meatball subs from here, and we're gonna get the chicken shawarma from there. And it was one of the ways that I identified and stayed connected to him because we were really just always painfully estranged. Hmm. Tell me how karate helped save your life. Well, so now this, right? So my, my parents uh, get divorced when I'm 12. And ironically, uh, I actually didn't see it coming. They, they were really good at kind of keeping whatever was going on behind closed doors until all of a sudden one day the relationship was over. And the world you thought you knew and the people you thought you knew and the life you thought you knew turns out to be a lie, right? All these skeletons come out of the closet. And it was like, my dad was a cocaine addict. I didn't know any of this until, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I thought we say no to drugs. What do you mean? <laughs> you know, it was just, I remember just being like, holy mother, like my whole, has all of this just been, you know, so it really... 
I spiraled at that point. Um, and I ended up at about 175 pounds and I was only maybe five feet tall at 12 years old. I'm not much bigger than that now, but <laughs> I'm five foot three now, but you know, 175 at, at, at five feet is, you know, that's not healthy. Um, and I was, uh, I was heavily bullied. I had a huge nose and I'm, I'm not trying to say that there's anything wrong with that, but I was just, I mean, every day I would walk into school and just be torn to shreds about either my weight or my nose. I had braces, I had acne. Um, and I was also a, a gay, but didn't know I was gay, but yet the other kids sensed it, you know? And so I would just get like literally eviscerated to the point that I was spending lunch in my eighth grade teacher's classroom because I just was like, I can't go like, out into gen pop. Like literally that's how it felt. Um, so my mom, you know, I'm in therapy because my mom's had me in therapy, but she gets me, she's dating a guy whose nephews are in martial arts. And I show kind of this fascination with it and an interest in it. And my mom takes me, I think, to audit a class and I end up uh, joining, yeah. getting into martial arts. And I will not pretend that this happened overnight, but being in an environment where A, I was accepted, right? So now I have a peer group. Um, B, I, I am around uh, individuals who expect me to be the best version of myself. Yeah. And there's something powerful to that, right? Like that's the difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy, I hate. Sympathy is like, oh, you, you sad, sorry little thing. Mm -hmm. Just do what you can. Empathy is like, yeah, I get that it's hard, but you're capable of doing this and you're going to do it and I'll accept nothing less than your best, right? Very different messages. So it, it put me in an environment where um, certain, certain elements of my potential that I had un were not realized were believed in. Wow. And, um, and I had friends and I was supported. And over time, and this really was kind of the pivotal moment for me was, I think I was, I really wish I could remember the exact age, but I do know it was my second degree black belt test. And in my, in my style of martial arts, it was white, yellow, blue, second blue. So it couldn't have been, I couldn't have been more than 14. Um, I was still in junior high. So I had to break these two boards with a sidekick. And I remember just thinking, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to do this. For months, I was like, I can't do it. There's no way I'm going to be able to do it. Oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do it. Make a long story short, I did it. And I remember that I walked into school the next day and I was still heavy, but I walked into school the next day, like ready to just to fight back. You know, I was like, enough's enough. I'm not going to be bullied. I'm not going to be harassed. Like the next person that says something to me is going to get it. It's fair game. And nobody did. And I was like, what is happening? Like nobody said a word to me. And I realized that it was the way I carried myself it was how I respected myself for the first time that people were like, oh, can't mess with her. There's, you just kind of put out this vibe of like, yeah, I won't be bullied. And it inhibits people that would normally do that. Um, so very gradually, I began to appreciate fitness as a means to empower people in all facets of their lives because of how it empowered me. Hmm. That's such a good story. So there were a lot of these moments in martial arts that sort of shaped me and my approach mm -hmm. over time. But I think that is part of why, oh, she's so tough love is because it, it did work with me. And nowadays we're so careful with feelings and, and I, that scares me because I had to have my feelings hurt a couple times to wake up. Yeah. You know, I had to be shown the reality of, what I was doing. And it's like, Hey, look, I get that. You know, you're going through a hard time, but you're responsible for how you're eating. You're re-victimizing yourself. Mm. Um, and there were, there were just a, a, a lot of moments like that where, you know, there was another one for me. I was, I don't know, 14, 15 sparring and, you know, times were different, right? This is it's so tough, <laughs> not everybody, not everybody got a participation medal. Yes. Yeah. It's like times were different. And I got kicked um, through the wall at, at, in the studio. And I remember like crying and having the wind knocked out of me. And then I got kicked again. And I was like, what the hell is the matter with you? Get kicked me, I'm a kid, you know? And I remember my karate teacher looked at me at one point as I'm like snotting and crying and can't breathe like a 
full blown, like you kicked me. And he was like, I swear to you, if you do not fight your way out of this corner, I will break your ribs. And I, <laughs> I was like, what? And I mean, like, I got out of that corner and I've been fighting my way out of the corner ever since. And I, I, my point is that life doesn't stop kicking you. And that's kind of the point he was making is that, yeah, it's not fair. It sucks. I'm much bigger than you and I'm far stronger, but that like, that's not going to make me stop. Like you're going to have to get your head in the game and find a way out of this. And, and so, you know, there were a lot of those moments, but it, it has given me such a gift over the course of my life, in my opinion. We could spend an awful lot of time talking about you graduating high school early or delivering pizzas or right. doing training or this uh, you started in Beverly Hills and a million other things. But you, you mentioned earlier, John, I'm known for tough love. I'm known for tough love. Yeah. You are through The Biggest Loser. I think that's where many people True. got their yes. first introduction into you. Many people. So just talk about where you got the opportunity to be part of that show. You know, oh God, that show, it's like a, that Latin quote, that which nourishes me also destroys me. Like I, I owe so much to it, but it's, it was also such a, such a difficult thing because I, had, I didn't have any control over it. Um, so the opportunity came up when I was, I think just turned 30. And I just opened up the sports medicine facility. One of the clients was like, hey, you know, there's this opportunity at NBC um, you know, you should go in for it. And I was like, oh, cause I didn't like the name of the show. And at the time, reality TV, there was just no, no inspirational reality TV. And he was like, you should do it. They're, they're going to make the, and I specifically remember this quote for better or for worse, but he was like, they're looking for like their Dr. Phil's of fitness. So I went in and, and to make a long story short, I, I did end up getting the job. Um, and, you know, there were struggles along the way with it. Everybody knows that I was on the show, off the show, fighting with the producers, this, that, the other. But um, <clears throat> like everything, there's good and bad. And working under that construct, which is not real life, where someone says, okay, we're bringing people to you who literally are 400 pounds, right? Some are 500 pounds. They're, more, they're hundreds of pounds overweight, morbidly obese. Yeah. Um, and it's basically a life or death intervention. You know, now people at home are like, okay, it's a TV show. For me, I was like, all right, I'm taking this seriously. This is a life or death intervention. And they could go home at any minute, which never happens. So under those circumstances, you've got this ticking clock. And I felt very quickly I had to make three things happen. Number one, I needed the individual to have a rock bottom moment because a lot of times we go through life in this kind of comfortable numb where we deny the pain of the way we're living and we shut down our emotions and we sort of sleepwalk through life in order to tolerate it. But the problem is your emotions are your compass. So it needs to be more painful where you're at with the way you've been living, more painful than your fear and the work associated with change in order to get someone motivated to make that change, right? It's like, you gotta think like, dear God, this is so bad. And even JK Rowling is like, rock bottom is a great place to build a new foundation. They need that moment. I then need them to take responsibility for where they're at, kind of like you and I were discussing a little bit earlier, if I'll allow them to stay in a state of being a victim. And now life does victimize us. We are, we are out of control the majority of the time. Bad things happen to good people. But if we live in this place, we perpetuate that cycle and we end up victimizing ourselves. And in the way it was like, you're eating this way, these are now your choices. If I can't empower them to take responsibility for where they're currently at, no matter what happened in their past, they're fundamentally disempowered to make any kind of changes because they're a victim, they're not in control. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece was a success. I needed a success in that gym. I needed the board moment, right? The breaking of the two boards where they went, oh my God, I always thought I was X, Y, and Z. And none of that's true. Like if I'm able to do this and I never thought that was possible, what else am I capable of? And it opened up this infinity of possibilities. So I needed those three things to happen and happen fast before they were sent home if I had any, any chance 
of them sort of sticking with the commitment to change because to be honest change is simple eat less move more use common sense with your food choices i didn't say it's easy and so to do that hard hard work of change i needed at least those three pieces to have any hope and prayer do you think that's true only on the biggest loser television program on nbc or do you think that's true for each and every one of us in every situation in our lives as we change forward it's true, but not, I don't, you can usually bring people there over the course of a year, you know? I, like, so part of the reason, you know, that I, people are like, oh, she was so crazy and she, because I needed it to happen in a week. You know what I mean? How much, so, I don't even know, how much time did you have with these contestants? In some cases a week before they'd be voted off the show. In some cases, four months, you know, it, it just depend, depended on when, they would go home and there was no way of knowing. So it could be seven to 10 days. It could be four months. What, Jillian, change is hard to make for a week or even <laughs> four months with cameras in front of us and Jillian Michaels yelling at us. Yeah. Eventually though, you go left and I go right. And unfortunately the camera crew stops tracking my progress. Yeah. For those, because I would imagine you fell in love with some of them. You fall in love with some, not all. That's just life. Some I talk to every week. You know what I mean? Some I talk to when they throw up a white flag. Some I talk to once a year when they check in, whether it's the Australian contestants or the US contestants. Some I never talk to, never liked me, I never liked them. Some I never even worked with, they weren't on my team. And that's just, that's just, you know, that's just life. So um, but how yeah. Do you urge them as they get ready to depart from you way back then. Yeah. And I'm asking this question for all of us as we try to sustain change in our lives. Oh, right. Um, how do we, when no one's looking, not only hit rock bottom, yeah. see the progress, take accountability, but keep moving forward. So here, here is the number one issue, you know, because the show got so much flack over the years. I'm like, well, they gained their weight back. First of all, let's do some statistics. 60% did, 40% didn't of the show's contestants. 95% of the people that lose a large amount of weight in gen pop put it back on. So statistically speaking, we were actually winning. And the reason for this is the same reason that people can relapse with cigarettes or relapse with alcohol or relapse with drugs or go back to a crappy relationship is it because we don't engage in destructive behaviors because we're weak or lazy or stupid. That's not it. At one time or another, and I promise you this is the truth, we engage in that habit because it meant our psychological survival. So again, for me as a kid, it meant control. It meant comfort. Um, it meant a connection to my father, right? I promise you, there is something so, so deep when we do these things. You go back to an abusive relationship, why? Because you're trying, you're probably playing out a pattern and a dynamic from a childhood relationship. You might not be conscious of it, but you're seeking to dominate that pattern, right? So you don't have to grieve the imperfections of your parents or the love you didn't get or the validation you didn't get. So you seek out a person who doesn't give it to you and then you're like, I will win you over. I will make you give it to me and I will heal that wound without ever having to acknowledge it, right? So why do they go back? Because they're denying this overwhelming pain that waits for them on the other side of realizing that it wasn't them and, and suffering that loss. Okay, so... When people go home, all the demons are still there and they're so hard to contend with and giving up this behavior that you probably don't even realize kept you emotionally safe is terrifying and painful and most people struggle with it tremendously, right? Yeah. That's why people gain weight back when they are morbidly obese. And again, it's why they fall off the wagon. The demons come back. So what I, obviously would love is for somebody to find a tremendous therapist and and do some deep work that's not the reality for most because they may not have access they may not have the funds um most importantly we've got to have a why you know and, and this has been talked about for a long time and it's a famous quote it's a nietzsche quote if you've got a why to live for you can tolerate the how right? The how is the work and the sacrifice associated with the goal. So what is your why? And a lot of people don't know. You know, they'll say work, love. I, I want money. I want love. I want health. 
what does that even mean? What does that even look like in your life? Like, is health to you raising money for breast cancer because you lost your mother to it and now you live your life in honor of her deem to fight it with everything in your in your being right is it is it walking your daughter down the aisle and you lost your father to 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 heart disease and you vow never to let your daughter feel that way about you is it wearing a two piece instead of a one piece is it feeling better naked like i don't care what it is as long as it matters to you so, 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 so much, that's a huge piece, right? If you've got the why, you can tolerate the how. Jillian, let, let me ask you around that. How do yeah. you help those you serve, those who read your books, those who watch your videos, those who are interviewing you to, un, to discover what their why is in the first place? How do we understand what our why is? You gotta ask leading questions and it takes time, right? So that it's like, what is it that you want? What is it? And a lot of times people don't know. I've asked this question so often and they, they really are like, uh, they kind of give you their little scooby, right? They, they speak in generalizations mm. on health. What does it mean? No idea. So, you know, and again, it's because we sort of walk through life in this comfortably numb state, doing what we think we should, feeling guilty about living the life we really want. So we lose touch with what we really want because we shut our emotions down. So we got to turn them back on because your feelings are your compass. So how do you then get in touch with your why if you don't know it? Here's an exercise. I could, you know, we could do your whole show on this, but here's an exercise um, that I like to give people. For, let's say two weeks, I want you to set an alarm on your phone to go off every hour on the hour. You know, waking, waking hours, I'm not a complete monster. <laughs> and when it goes off, you I want you to your, take- Your moniker of being a, a, a tough, hard-loving right? person. Yeah, just- <laughs> No sleep, O'Leary, for the next two weeks. Exactly. I'll break you down like a seal. We will get to the heart of the issue. No, you can sleep. You can sleep. Um, when it goes off, right? When the alarm goes off, I want you to stop and take an inventory of what you're doing and how does it make you feel. If you're playing with your kids and you think, my God, I love kids. It's when I feel I'm my most free. Maybe you open a preschool. Maybe you open a daycare, right? If you are cooking dinner with your family and you think, oh, I love this. This is such an outlet for me. Maybe you start a catering company. Martha Stewart did. She's doing just fine. You know, maybe I, I want you to, to play this game. And if it's something you're doing that you hate, right? If you're like, oh, I'm sitting with this group of people from work. I absolutely hate them. I'm miserable. Maybe it's time to start looking for a different job, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to be careful. If I'm working at it and I hate it, well, okay, let's go a step further. Do you like the result of it? That's what I need you to look at, right? But playing this game of pausing, being present, which we're seeing so much of with meditation nowadays, right? Being mindful, being in the moment. Why? So you can make decisions that'll affect the quality of your life because you're present and feeling your feelings. That's gonna be your compass and your guide, professionally, personally, and with regard to your health. Oh my God, I did this and I loved it. And it felt great, great, we're gonna do more of it, right? If you're hanging out with someone, they make you feel good, cultivate the friendship. They make you feel bad, get rid of the friendship or put boundaries on the relationship. So start practicing this mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. Being present and taking an inventory of how each and everything you're doing makes you feel, no matter how big or how small, and move towards the things that feel good and move away from the things that feel bad. Jillian, what are some things that we are doing to our body to our soul, to our psyche, that we're even unaware that we are having a negative impact on our lives. I, I think let's just recognize when we're on our fifth deep fried Twinkie, we might uh, be making a mistake this morning for breakfast. Like th these are pretty easy things, but I think there's a lot of stuff that we just do and we don't even recognize that there's a negative blowback in doing so. If it were things that I think people don't recognize, because I actually think we're pretty aware, like I really should not go to the drive-thru today. I think we, I think that, that's why I always tell people common sense, man, common sense eating. Because um, you generally are going to know that a chicken salad is better than pizza and a soda. But I think people know that. Where I, I often think they can get into trouble is when they fall victim to false information. And unfortunately, you know, nowadays, there's no fact checking for better and for worse. Anybody and everybody can have a platform. So great people have no barrier to entry because there aren't gatekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, 
anybody can say anything on any platform and there's no way to vet the information. You could go on YouTube right now and watch 10 different things on nutrition, none of which are vetted, fact-checked. And then people are like, I just don't even understand. Is keto good? Is keto bad? She says it's good. He says it's bad. So I, I think that they, they fall victim to misinformation and trends and don't even realize it. My housekeeper's so cute. The other day she was like, mind you, has been with me for 15 years and has just now decided to ask me about nutrition. I'm like, you realize that you could have asked me this at any point, but she's like, she's, she's like, I'm worried about uh, type two diabetes. She has, she's by the way, healthy, doesn't have to worry, but she's like, so I stopped eating bananas. Is that, is that okay? And I was like, holy cow. You know what I mean? Like things like that, that she doesn't, it's just misinformation, nutrition and fitness advice that's poor that can cause injuries or uh, health issues, things like that, that worry me. As far as working out and remember you're speaking to uh, at least me, I can't speak for all of my listeners, but people who are really busy and we're managing a million responsibilities and it's coming at us from a thousand different directions. How do we begin finding the appropriate amount of time to, uh, to take care of ourselves? And I don't see that part of the reason I love your work is it's not just eating differently, John. It's <laughs> differently, John. It's living differently, living more healthily. And so how do we uh, thoughtfully begin managing our life more effectively going forward? I'm very type A. So I actually have like a formula. Yeah, yeah. Here, please. <laughs> and um, as crazy as this sounds, it actually works for me. Like I'm going to give you concrete step-by-step instructions. Let's look at it as follows. Sleep is critical. You cannot compromise it. And my answer is if I don't compromise it, you shouldn't have to compromise it either. Seven to, unless you have a newborn, seven to eight hours of sleep. So if we're getting seven to eight hours of sleep a night, let's say eight, we're super lucky. Eight hours of sleep a night, that leaves us with 112 waking hours in a week. This is how nuts I am. Now, I'm a single mom. I'm, I'm not. I'm very fortunate to have a great co-parent. But let's, let's say I'm a single dad, a single mom. I, I'm all by myself with kids now, right? So now I've given you the most intense scenario, single working parent. Okay. Pandemic. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay. Single working parent. And the reason it's the, the hardest scenario is time wise, yeah. you're getting crunched the most, right? Get 112 waking hours. If you take 50 to run your household and that's take the dog to the vet, uh, help your, luckily the kids aren't in school right now. Thank goodness. But like spend an hour a day on the homework with them in the, you know, or maybe it was shuttling them to a soccer game when that was a thing back when life was. Way back in early. Way back in 2019 when we took kids to extracurricular activities. You know, you drop your laundry off. You spend 50 hours running the home, okay? And by the way, your kid's life doesn't have to be perfect. I drag my kids around. I'm like, we're taking the dog to the vet. They go in the car with me. Like, you know, my mom, that's what my mom did with me. It wasn't like, let me entertain you. It was like, we had a home to run. Right. I got tossed in the car and we went to the market. So sometimes quality time is also going to be errand time. That's life. I actually think it's good for kids personally, but I am certainly no parenting expert. So, you know, 50 hours to run the home, 50 hours to work. Um, And that's, you know, most of us have a 40 hour work week. Some of us have a longer work week. Let's say it's 50 hours. You have 12 hours that I don't care what you have to do. You will schedule 12 hours a week for your emotional and physical health. So that could be four half hour workouts in your living room. It could, which is two hours. It could be one maintenance appointment, be it your internist, your dentist, your hairstylist, one a week. And over the course of the month, you've seen the doctor, the dentist, your hair has been done. You're, you know what I mean? It, it, it adds up because it's an appointment a week. So let's say that's another two hours. We're at four. You now are like, all right, I love horseback riding or paddle boarding, or I don't care, gardening, whatever it is. You're going to spend a couple hours doing that a week, depending on the hobby. It might be one session. If it's gardening in your yard, it might be four 30 minute sessions. A couple hours doing that. We're at six. You've got, I'm going to see my friends one night. I've got a game night with my friends this Saturday. I got a babysitter. I'm going to go do game night for three to four hours, maybe three hours, have dinner, do game night, see my friends, come home. Yeah. You know, a friend thing. I circulate my friend groups or I get them all in one group, maybe a date night. And by the way, I'm lucky because I have a, a, a co-parent, so I get to borrow some of her 50 hours to run the household. So it gets easier, luckily, if you have a co-parent, 
Yes. Or if you don't yet have kids. But I take 12 hours and that should be the minimum for a friend thing, a hobby thing, two hours of fitness, uh, a, a, a hygiene maintenance medical thing. And that's how I stay sane. And it isn't perfect, but it's certainly good enough. Well, it's how you stay sane. I'm curious, how do you stay so brave? It's difficult, I think, to put yourself out there, in particular in the market we live in today. When you start a Biggest Loser, social media was not what it is now. I know, right? Now, every single time you say anything, there is someone there to tear you down. I know. And so is bravery something that can be taught? I would love to give myself credit for this, but unfortunately, um, as a public figure, you and somebody who and, and again i don't i don't mean to sound like arrogant it's just that i i was able to become high profile in my field which essentially just means you've got a, a bigger target on your back right so it's like i'm gonna take her out and if i do a video about her her name's gonna come up in search right so it's like jillian's a monster jillian's horrible if i mention jillian it gets me pressed what can i say about jillian and I am a D level celebrity. Imagine this on a, on a big level. And I'm not asking you to have sympathy for celebrities. I'm simply explaining that I get dragged into the public arena in these knockdown drag out character assassinations on a rag on a regular basis. So what I might've been afraid to engage in, I've been forced to live through a thousand times over. Do you ignore it or do you, do you just choose to, uh, no, to I don't ignore them. I, I won't ignore them. I think that's a mistake. Um, because I think that people believe this stuff. As crazy as it sounds, I, I think they do. And I think it was Winston Churchill who said, like a lie makes it all the way around the world while the truth is just putting on its pants. And the truth isn't sexy, by the way. So do you think anyone ever printed like, oh, all of these lawsuits were actually dismissed. They were complete bunk. No, because it's not good. It's not sexy news. You know, sexy news is Jillian Michaels, is all you know x y or z that's clickbait been in unfortunately you're in that situation as a public figure fortunately you then develop like a really thick skin and you're like all right you know i live through this i can live through that i can live through whatever the world throws at me and you become used to it mm -hmm. whereas a person who isn't in that position um and i and i think the world is far more unfair to a person that isn't in that position and here's why Nowadays, with cancel culture, when you have your own platform, your own platform is your own platform. My app is my app. You can buy it or not buy it, but no one can fire me from it. Which, you know, if you're an employee somewhere, you get enough pressure and it's like, oh, they fire you and they cancel you and they'll never hire you again. Like, that's really scary. And that to me is, is something that we are experiencing as a society that is beyond terrifying. I, I, I liken it to McCarthyism, I really do, or like the Salem witch trials that, that is not allowing people to have a freedom of speech. That's terrifying. So I am lucky to have, A, been out there and cast in the worst possible light of any and every kind and survived and had thick skin. And I'm also lucky enough to have a platform that to a certain extent insulates me because I'm self-employed. Mm. So I don't, I don't think I'm brave. I think I'm lucky and I've just <laughs> inherently been through a lot. Not, not long ago, Jillian, I saw you, I believe it was on Instagram, you were fielding a question from a lady who had lost a lot of weight and was saying, and the quote is something to the effect of, one day I'm going to become a physical trainer myself. Oh, yeah. And you, you like put the question aside, you thought for a moment, and then you look back at the camera and you just like let this person have it. Not I know. <laughs> way, but tough love, baby, you brought the heat. What was it about the one day comment that set you off? Because one day never comes, right? And, and we get caught up in tomorrow. And I, I don't think it's because we're being lazy. I, I often find that tomorrow is when I think I'm good enough. Right. I, I find that it's a fear of failure or conversely, a fear of success. That is what makes people put these things off. So it's, she's like, when I, I just have a little more to go or a little more to lose. So it's always when I'm good enough. But good enough never comes because you'll then find another reason why you're not good enough. I just need another certification or I just need to lose two more pounds or I just want to get this cellulite off my legs. Like, I mean, if I waited for that day, oh my God, I would have accomplished nothing. So, you know, and the other, the other great thing is that 
when we fail, and, and I want people to mitigate risk, I want them to have all of the information so that the actions they take are more likely to yield powerful and positive results, right? You know, right. you jump out of a plane, you're certainly going to learn how to pack that chute before you do to increase your chances of a nice, soft, gentle landing. So I want people to be educated, but when we fail, it's simply an opportunity to learn, right? And I've also found in my life, it's preparing me for the right person, place, or thing that's waiting just around the corner in life for me to be better. Mm. So the final question before we pivot into the Live Inspired 7, it comes from one of our followers, a lady named Heather A. And she wants to know when you fail, how do you give yourself grace? There were a lot of questions we got, but I think this one ties directly into what you were just sharing. So Jillian, when you fail, when you sleep in, when you yeah. eat fried Twinkies or whatever else it might be, when you fail on business, when you get kicked off a show or a million other things happen in your life, how do you give yourself grace? So there's two different kinds of things, right? Like there's failing, I didn't get the job. And in that case, I reframe it. And I think of it as like, wow, I was really courageous there, right? Like I put myself out there, I took the risk. Now let me look at why I didn't get it so that I can incorporate, if there's a lesson for me there, right? I can clean up my side of the street if I'm responsible in any way so that I'll be ready for the next job interview or relationship or whoever that comes my way. Um, and, and, and hopefully that will be the right person, place or thing. You know, they say like rejection is God's protection, things like that. Like I actually, I actually believe that, but you got to do the work too. You got to then go, all right. So now let me, let me look at, you know, my side of the street. With that said, if you're engaging in a destructive behavior intentionally, like eating the fried Twinkie, I find that self-loathing is actually self-love because what you really know is that you're capable of more. <laughs> you're really saying like, you can do better than this. So you really actually do believe in yourself. It's just how you, again, we got to reframe it. So it's like, all right, I know I can do better. I know I can do more. Number one is beating myself up, but going to accomplish anything. Of course not. Right. It's like you get a flat tire. Do you get out of the car and slash the other three tires and bash on the windshield? No, <laughs> no, you change the tire and you move on. Right. Um, but also I want you to look at like, why did you eat the Twinkie? What's going on emotionally? And how can you, if it's like, I was stressed, I was anxious. How can we nurture you and comfort you in ways that are not self-destructive? So I remember my shrink said this to me and it was some of the best advice. And it was after I got out of a bad relationship. Cause I kind of liken all these things to the same sort of like, you date someone that's not like, great for you. You eat the fried Twinkie, same stuff. So he's like, I want you to date yourself for a while. And I was like, are you nuts? I'm not paying you to tell me to die alone. <laughs> what kind of advice is that? And he, what he meant is he's like, I want you hmm. to pick up the food you want for dinner. Because it was always like, what do you want for dinner? What can I get you, right? I want you to get flowers for yourself for the bedside table. I want you to, like all the ways you consider the, your loved ones in life, consider yourself. Let's wrap up with seven quick fire questions to uh, tie this show up in a beautiful knot or bow. Of course. All them the Live Inspired Seven. There's seven questions I've asked all my guests. And the very first one, it's kind of a layup question in particular for someone who's written, I think you've written nine books. Uh, what's the best book you've ever read, Jillian? Fiction or nonfiction? This is impossible. Fiction or nonfiction? So you know the answer is going to be yes. So like, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, the corner. I want you to be as broad and as. Oh my God. I mean, it could be like, I'd have to go with my five that first come to mind. So like as a kid and still to this day, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the Princess Bride. Um, just love the Chronicles of Narnia, um, even still. Uh, yeah. And I get to read those with my kids, which is awesome. Anything raw doll, love, obsessed, James and the Giant Peach, all of that stuff. Uh, as an adult, I really love nonfiction. Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning was life-changing for me. Anything Michio Kaku, uh, I'm obsessed with. Physics of the Impossible, Physics of the Future. Uh, I'm really fascinated with anything, you know, quantum mechanics. Like, I don't understand any of it, but the little that I do understand is like church for me. Like, I literally, you know how Einstein said, like, if you could understand the theory of everything, he would understand the mind of God. I actually believe it. Like I, I, I think religion provides a lot in our lives with regard to morality and ethics and, and how we treat each other and how we live. But I also think that science coexists because it's, in my personal opinion, 
it is proof of something so magnificent. So like a Michio Kaku book or a Brian Greene, The Fabric of the Cosmos, love. Like I have to read each page 10 times sometimes, but love it. Um, grade, but it's powerful stuff. And love it, yeah. They're going to get progressively harder. But Yeah, I think- like, uh, but those, are, those are my top lines. Those are my top lines. The second question is, what is one positive characteristic, one trait that you had as a little girl growing up in Southern Cal that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? God, I really think I've improved so much. I would say that I've gotten better mostly across the board. Oh, I'm sorry, my daughter, you can come in. You want to finish this part with me? Yes. Come sit, my little chicken. This is my friend, John. John, this is Lou. Hi. You want to sit Good to see you live. Lou, what do you think? What is a good quality that I should exhibit better in uh, from childhood? I'm far less. Cr- I was far less cranky as a kid, and I don't think I ever once asked for a manager. I definitely. <laughs> I never asked for a manager. <laughs> she doesn't ever ask for a manager. I call you Karen. I just learned the expression. I'm yeah, so- I am absolutely that Karen. I will absolutely ask for the freaking manager, and I'm not ashamed of it. As a kid, I think I had aha. I had less expectation than I do as an adult, and that's a dangerous thing. I wish I had less Great expectation. Answer. Jillian Michaels, if your home caught fire and those precious children and that, that little dog are out safe, and everybody's out safe, and you have an opportunity to run back in your home and grab one thing that matters to you, what would you grab? I, if, I, if, my safe, if my safe wasn't so heavy, I'd grab that. You, okay, well, we actually had this happen and, um, in 2018 in the Malibu fires. I would grab, there's one thing that I miss so much that breaks my heart. Do you know what? All my daughter's stuff, um, there was a necklace that she had on when I picked her up um, and was able to bring her home and it was in the safe. Is this gonna make you sad, baby? Oh, I'm sorry. So I wish I had that. Describe it for me. Oh, I'm sorry, boob. It was really hard on the kids. Um, It was made of like these little, plastic colorful beads and some foam like this foam and it was like pink and blue and red i have a picture of it obviously because you were wearing it when grandma joanne and i came in scooped you up forever oh don't be sad you're gonna make me sad um hey lou so- I'll, let me tell you i when i was a nine-year-old boy i was in a house fire and i got burned in my entire body and that was really sad and very hard and then when I was 28, my mom and dad had a second fire and they lost everything, all of our necklaces and everything else that we loved. And so I asked that question because it's something we've gone through as a family. And so we understand the pain of losing something that you love so much, but thank heavens you still have your mom, you still have your family. That is, that is what we had to remind ourselves of. And of course my mom, the magna cum laude therapist was very good at, at helping us all realize that home was the family. Oh, we're letting the dogs in. Um, you know, that home home was, was with us. It was, we are home. And, you know, no physical place was home. And we were all so lucky to get ourselves out and the animals out and everybody was safe. I was on a plane home from Miami. I was working. Um, so my, uh, my ex, um, you know, unfortunately was in that situation and had to, had to flee pretty quick. Well, let me just ask you a couple of questions and then, then we'll wrap up. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous Southern California day and sit next to anybody, living or dead, who would you love to be seated right next to? Oh, I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Beyonce? Are they dead or alive? You choose, living or dead. Einstein. Hmm. Especially for Jillian Michaels with the dog barking to the tutor arriving. It has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. Jillian Michaels, how would you like your one sentence to read? I have an answer for you, and I actually wrote it down, not knowing that um, anyone would ever ask me this, but it came to me one day. I think that I am a narrow conduit for something greater. Jillian Michaels, let Lou remind you that you (laughs) need a narrow conduit for something far greater than yourself. I want to thank you for not only selling 100 million DVDs, and eight number one best-selling books and everything else you've done professionally, but for inspiring others to recognize there's more for them in their lives. No, thank you for having me on and for all you do. And you are awesome. And you got to come on my show now. Jillian, it will be my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it already. 
Well, my friends, that was Jillian Michaels. I am John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired.